Hi there, everybody. Good evening. Thanks for joining with me another week. Um, this is French Boston Church's 7 p.m. Wednesday night Bible study. I say another week. I assume most of you are not new tonight, but if you are, thanks for joining with me. Check out our reading plans on our website, friendshipwesleyan.com. Go to the Wednesday night. Um, it'll be a drop down. I think it's the middle drop down. And you can find our reading plans right now. We are in the Gospel of Luke, as I'm sure most of you are aware of, part two. Um, if you've been following along, you know that I got my schedule reading plan totally mixed up. The intention originally was to go through Easter and to get Easter to match up events during the Easter season with the Gospel of Luke. So we did a 12 week. Now we're doing a part two, which is nine weeks long. And uh, Palm Sunday is going to line up with April the 6th. So that'll be the Wednesday before Palm Sunday. And then April 13th will be before Good Friday on the 15th. And we'll be tackling that. It's in uh, Good Friday is in that text. Palm Sunday is in the text before. And then Easter will actually be the Wednesday after Easter on April 20th, meaning in the text of Luke, we'll be covering uh, those events. And your reading schedule, if you have a Luke reading schedule, uh, lines up with those weeks. So then April 20th is our last study and you're probably wondering where we're headed after that. And I wanted to tell you, we're going to, I've worked through it. I fought long and hard. I made a list of all the places since 2012. We've studied in the Bible and I've decided that we're going to go back to the book of Exodus, the book of Exodus reading plan. We uh, very recently did Genesis. I think we were beginning to get a good grasp on a biblical timeline. That is so helpful for me. You may not be like me, but as I study the Bible, to have an image of a biblical timeline history, if you will, helps me with the biblical stories and understanding and interpretation. So this is going to be an 18 week, actually about 19 weeks, because the first study is going to be an introduction to how we study the Bible Wednesday night. And I'm going to do that on April 27th, so the following week after the end of our Luke Bible study. And then that'll take us through most of the summer, our Exodus. And Exodus is going to be a fun journey. We finished up uh, the book of Genesis with the whole story of Joseph, the tribes of Israel, how they ended up in Egypt. And we're going to pick it up from there and head off to the promised land. And then maybe after that, we'll tackle Joshua, uh, the historical books they're known as. So we'll get the historical books in to get a good grasp of what happens, uh, historically speaking, in the Old Testament. So grab your Bibles and uh, open up to... Luke chapter 17, verse 11 through 18, 14. We're picking up where we left off last week. Let me begin our time together, as we always do with a word of prayer. Father, what a joy to know your word, to know you better through it. As we think of the things that we've studied, that we're studying tonight, um, Father, we just really feel like we're growing closer to you and uh, through, through your living word, the living word of God, our Heavenly Father. So teach us tonight, Holy Spirit, guide and direct us. Father, we, we constantly confess and admit on our own and by ourselves, we're just going to misinterpret, we're going to misunderstand, we're going to miss the point. So Father, help us tonight through the power of your spirit to receive the message you want us to receive. We pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, so I got something, you know, over the weeks, I have used different timelines, probably more than anything else, this Bible project timeline, the Gospel of Luke. I've pointed out to you that this middle section is where we are right now. It begins in chapter 9, verse 51, and it ends over here in chapter 19, verse 28, actually. And then we, and their teachings stories, parables along the road to Jerusalem. 
And then in chapter 19, verse 29, we're going to pick up uh, around that spot in chapter 19, the triumphal entry, Palm Sunday, which we already kind of talked about. But I wanted to take, I wanted to show you something. I found another timeline that was done. Now, before um, you totally, well, let me just show you. <laughs> and I thought, you know, I was thinking as soon as they see this, they're going to go, what in the world are we supposed to make of that? Let me explain it to you. This is actually, if you will, this section right here, the Jerusalem journey teachings is this section. Matter of fact, if you, hopefully you can see this, our in-house crowd will not be able to see this well at all, but um, you can see chapter 9, verse 51, to Jerusalem. Then if you can see my mouse pointer, and then all of these green are all of the stories, events, parables, where it's a parable, it says P-A-R, um, and, and all of the things that takes place on that journey to Jerusalem. So we down here at the bottom, chapter 12, verse 57, we pick it back up over here, and all the green is the gospel of Luke, and all of these parables and stories. So, um, so you, can, you can see, matter of fact, uh, hopefully you can see my cursor, my mouse here, and you can see down here days of, of Noah, days of Lot, this section right here, um, 17, well, actually verse 11, 10 healed of leprosy. We're not gonna spend a lot of time on that. Kingdom of God um, and through 18, 14. So this right here are the stories we're hanging out on, the events we're hanging out on tonight. And actually, oh boy, we're only gonna get to one, but that's one of the reasons why I'm showing you this. So you kind of see how this works. Now, let me, because it doesn't show through 1928 or whatever verse that is. So let me show you something. So now this is a piece together. If you go to, let's see, um, BibleDiagrams.com. I, I don't see it on here. Yeah, BibleDiagrams.com. You can find these. Um, they have some cool diagrams like this. This is one diagram, and this is the other one that fits neatly together. So when I was showing you down here at the bottom, we pick it back up and we had this direction and we're looking at the green again, you can see all of the stories on our road to Jerusalem. So now I'm gonna, I'm gonna go away from this screen and I'm gonna go to just this. So remember this one that we saw a moment ago, this one, and then let me take you to this one. Okay, so what we, so now we pick up right here, Luke chapter 18, and we follow all the way over here. Uh, this is flowing out of that other diagram, Luke 19, 27, the parable of the 10 minas. So, and that's what we've been studying on the road to Jerusalem. When we get to triumphal entry, we pick it up right here, okay? So just a cool a diagram. Um, you can find it on BibleDiagrams.com, just a cool diagram. Now, I showed you all that to say this. Now, <laughs> you can be gracious to me, and you understand better when I tell you, I don't get to all the parts of the text. So if you're frustrated from week to week, um, you can be nice to me tonight when I tell you that we're only going to get to one text tonight. Okay, so let's open. I asked you to open your Bible. Open it up to chapter 17, verse 11, and we're going to begin taking a look. And while I'm thinking about it, let me say real quick also that, boy, I tackled this text, you know, and studied through it some, and then I decided on where we were going to hang out most of our time. Really, and this is to show you it doesn't always happen this way, expecting there's so much in this portion of text that we're going to see that begs the question that I thought we were probably going to dig up some some uh, treasures not seen in the text itself, you know, through language study and stuff like that. And this is one of those studies where it just didn't happen that way. Really, when you read it at first, it seems like it raises a lot of questions. When you go back and study, it's fairly obvious um, stuff that, that even when you think it through a surface read, um, 
is is sufficient enough to really understand what's going on. But we'll get to that in a minute. So in verse 11, I'm not going to read this text for you, but 11 through 19, we have uh, Jesus healing the 10 with leprosy. He heals them all, and only one returns to say thank you. I love this story. Um, sermons on gratitude make you think of this, but there's a lot, a lot in this text also that we could dig up because the, the guy that comes back and says, thank you. If you read the text is a S Samaritan, which raises a whole nother question in the text. Jesus brought up Samaritans when he was trying to get the Jews to think the S Samaritans were looked down on by the Jews. And I won't go into all that or we'll be studying that. So you do your study. I love this portion. I love this story. So you do your study on that. Um, and then there will be a few other things in the, in the complete text that I gave you for the reading plan that you're going to have to dig on also. But so here's where we're going to spend our time tonight. Um, Luke chapter 17, verses 20 through 37, the coming of the kingdom of God. If you have a study Bible um, and it gives a topical heading, it may be something to that effect. The coming of the kingdom of God. My little graphic here, how to miss the kingdom of God. That's actually included in this text. There's more than that. But Jesus' warnings on his kingdom, on his coming kingdom, Luke 17. So let's read it first. Let me read the entirety of the text to you, okay? So follow along with me, beginning verse 20. Once on being asked by the Pharisees, take note of who Jesus is speaking to, when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, the coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed, nor will people say, here it is or there it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst. Then he says to his disciples, so he switches who he's speaking to, the time is coming when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, but you will not see it. People will tell you, there he is or here he is. Do not go running off after them, for the Son of Man in his day will be like the lightning, which flashes and lights up the sky from one end to the other. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so also will it be in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating, drinking, marrying, and being given in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the, it was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking and buying and selling, planting and building. But the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just like this. On the day the Son of Man is revealed, on that day, no one who is on the housetop with possessions inside should go down to get them. Likewise, no one in the field should go back for anything. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever tries to keep their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life will preserve it. I tell you, on that night, two people will be in one bed. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding grain together. One will be taken and the other left. Where, Lord, they asked, he replied, where there is a dead body, there the vultures will gather. <laughs> and, and especially that, like that last portion of that text, right? It almost seems like, what's that doing there? You know, that uh, it seems a strange thing to add at the end there. But um, one of the things I do when I'm reading through a text are, okay, what are key concepts that I think I'm going to have to know more about when I go back to study this? It's one of the reasons why I zeroed in on this text is there's some key concepts that I'm somewhat familiar with, but I thought in this, in this Luke chapter 17, would probably reveal some things that I wasn't seeing. Um, those key concepts that I see in the text, these are just, remember, our study is observation interpretation, application. In the observation mode of reading the text, um, uh, the kingdom of God um, is often a very studied uh, idea. Um, and then uh, this whole idea of the day or days 
of the son of man. I'm like, okay, maybe those are going to reveal some things in this text that I'm not seeing at a first read. But I mentioned to you already, I want to make sure that we notice uh, who Jesus is speaking to in the first part of this. He switches fairly quickly, but he's speaking to the Pharisees because they're coming and they're asking when the kingdom of God would come. So here we are with the Pharisees again. I'm, they're religious leaders. Um, they often tried to trap Jesus or bring up some doctrinal thing of theirs to question him and to question his teachings. And, uh, and so it really made me think, here we are again, you know, with these guys trying to trap Jesus, um, like I said, which they were in the habit of doing, or maybe they had some doctrinal thing they're raising to him. And what I found out is eh, both, neither, um, that's not necessary. Remember, our goal here is to get to the point. The point wasn't really that, especially in Jesus' um, re response. So because, and then I, I told you there's some obvious things, right? So what they mean by the kingdom of God, that's where when I first read it through, I'm thinking, what are these Pharisees thinking when they ask Jesus about the kingdom of God? Well, actually, it's, it's pretty simple. They're just referring to the Messiah as they understand the coming of the Messiah um, in the, um, the ancient scriptures and the, what they knew of scripture. Um, and so they're questioning about the coming of the Messiah. So the kingdom, the kingdom of God, and from that point on. So when is it that the kingdom of God is going to come in the Messiah. Now, I think it's important to point out here, because it helps us to understand Jesus' response a little bit. So what would they be thinking when they're thinking about the coming of God, the Messiah, the kingdom of God, the, the Messiah? They're thinking about fanfare, um, ticker tape parades. They're thinking about earthly kingdoms. They're thinking about all of the things that we think about when we think of power and authority and and uh, and success and whatever we think about in life, right? <clears throat> so Jesus responds to them, right? Did you catch his response? The coming of the kingdom of God is something that can, uh, is not something that can be observed. Now, um, now what, he's, what he's basically saying to them, because he goes on to say, nor will people say, here it is or there it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst. So he's saying, hey, it's not something that you're imagining, because what they're imagining is this fanfare and this, um, all of this human glory and stuff like that. And Jesus is saying, that's not the way it's going to be. It's not going to happen the way you think. As a matter of fact, it's happening, and you're not even perceiving it. Wow, pretty powerful stuff, right? So then he turns to the disciples. So that's his resp response to the Pharisees. So then he, he turns to the disciple and he starts talking about the days of the Son of Man. The, the time is coming when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man. And there's probably more than one implication here. So I just want to point that out. When I, when I work through it, I'm like, okay, there's a couple of implications uh, there's an obvious one. He's speaking to the disciples. Remember I said, watch who's being spoken to. That, that, that's really huge in interpretation and understanding. So he's speaking to the disciples. Um, so as a matter of fact, I have a note here. Um, look at verse 25. So he says to the disciples, there's coming a time uh, when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, verse 25, but first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. So he's obviously saying to the guys, to the disciples, hey, you guys don't fully get it either. Um, I have to suffer and die, and you will long to be back to one of these days with me now. Um, you will long to be back. The good old days with Jesus that they're walking, right? Um, when they see the suffering Jesus, the long for one of those days. As a matter of fact, let, let me do this. I, I made a uh, uh, slide for you out of this, just so you can see the intensity of what Jesus says. But first, he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. What? Wow, what intensity. And I've been reading a lot lately on how 
um, we readily accept the glorified, um, the I win at everything, get everything, and if I've got Jesus, everything goes good thing. We, we readily accept that, and but then we have a really hard time with the suffering Jesus. One of the reasons I say this is the disciples were obviously having a hard time with the suffering Jesus. And if you follow Jesus' interaction with him, Peter actually, um, I preached on that this past Sunday, rebukes Jesus um, uh, uh, various times for his talk about dying and, uh, and, and, and so Peter was having this conflict where he was, he was willing to accept Jesus, but the suffering Jesus, he wasn't willing to accept. And hopefully we're growing because the last couple of years, we've really been through some suffering. Um, and I think w w if you've heard my sermon on we're in the middle, um, so there's constant suffering, but it seems to have been more intense lately, right? But I've been reading, I told you I was reading on this, so I want to read a portion of text for you from a book um, that uh, recently that speaks into this and, and meant a lot to me. So I want to read it to you about the suffering Jesus and our suffering for him too. Is it any wonder Jesus did not stop reminding the 12 again and again that God's way of salvation is slow and small? a mustard seed to demonstrate that the power is always God's and not ours. Imagine if Peter had not broken, been broken by his humiliating failures, but was leading the church after Pentecost from a place of smugness and unteachability. Imagine if Paul, with all his gifting, drive, and intellect, had not had a thorn in the flesh that he could not remove or pray away. Imagine if Moses had not spent 40 years in exile in Midian after murdering an Egyptian, or had not experienced the humiliations of unjust accusations and rebellions against his leadership during his 40 years in the desert. Suffering and failure have always been God's mean, means to transform us from, willf from willful to willing from swimming upstream uh, uh, against the current of God's love to floating downstream, trusting in him to take care of us. It is also the primary way he teaches us to be patient. You ever heard somebody say, don't pray for patience because tribulation worketh patience, the King James Version said. All that to say, just to challenge us a little bit when suffering and difficulties come, God's up to good. All things work together for good to those who love Jesus. And we need to lean into and understand and accept that suffering part of our peace in Christ. So, uh, and it also made me think of all the disciples and how they suffered horrible lives and deaths because of Jesus. Um, we, we right now don't. Uh, we could, but we don't. And, uh, and what if they hadn't lived into that, giving their lives and laying their lives down for Christ? We would be lost. So it's obvious that Jesus was saying to the disciples, hey, you're going to long for the old days when you, uh, when you didn't see me suffering like this and from your own suffering. But then there's an obvious implication. If I was reading it, you'd think that sounds like the second coming. Most scholars agree that um, that there's an obvious reference to, to the second coming of Jesus, the time between his ascension and his return since, uh, since then, right? So, and we're living in that right now, right? From when he went up to heaven until his second coming, his return. So when he says that to them, the son of man in his day, or the when he's speaking to the disciples, it's an implication for them. It's also an implication for them and for us and for all those that were listening that the second coming of, of Jesus is in this text as well. Um, so, you know, I thought since then, because he says that, right, many will come. Um, one, of the, one of the first things he says, uh, people will tell you there he is or here he is. Do not, do not go running after them. And I had begun to work into all the different claims from people since uh, Jesus went back to heaven who, who have claimed to be Jesus since then, God's son. And I decided, no, you know that. And just to say, you know, in this spot in the middle where we are, um, we already have that. Verse 24 said 
that his second coming um, for the Son of Man in his day will be like the lightning with flash, which flashes and lights up in the sky from one end to the other. So, you know, what does that mean? Kind of obvious too, right? You can't predict lightning. I, I was listening to a news report the other day. They're getting closer and better at being able to predict um, when lightning will occur, but they still can't uh, predict it. And I doubt they'll be able to absolutely say when lightning is going to strike where you are or you know the exact moments and places that's going to happen. So you can't predict when lightning is going to strike. And that's basically what he says then. He's talking about the days of Noah, right? But first of all, this reminded me of another text that we've already seen in the gospel of Luke. Let me get there. I've got it on the screen for you. <clears throat> in Luke chapter 12, verse 40, I meant to add that here. I, I forgot. Sorry about that. But Luke, if you're making taking notes, Luke chapter 12, verse 40, you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. So what Jesus has to say in this gospel and all the gospel is fitting to anything else he has said. So back in 1240, here he's saying like lightning. So then in verse, I don't, you know, when I'm first reading it through, I'm like, you know what, this whole thing about as in the days of Noah and the days of Lot, there's got to be some, you know, hidden mysteries in there that we're going to dig up. And it's, it's really kind of obvious, right? So when you read that, just as it was in the days of Noah, so also, also it will, will be in the days of the Son of Man, the second coming of Jesus. People were eating and drinking and marrying, be given in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. Um, and then verse 28, as it was, uh, it was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking and buying and selling. So what's the obvious implication there, right? Because with Lot, we're talking about Sodom and Gomorrah that were destroyed by fire, right? What were people doing in both cases in Jesus' account here? The normal things of life. They were just living life. I've preached into that and taught about that, that there's more to life than life. And this is one of those texts that lets us know. And I think that's going to be the point here, really. There's more to life than life. These people were living. They were just, they were living life. Um, and a lot of people are just living life now. So what was the problem? They were ignoring God. Um, they were, uh, they had totally gotten away from God and were ignoring God. If you know that those stories from the Old Testament, you know that that's the case, that they actually have become wicked and evil. And so there's living life and, um, and allowing just living life to separate us from from God. And so I think that's the obvious implication here with these two stories. Then in verse 30, it'll be just like this on the day of the Son of Man, the second coming of Christ. On that day, no one who is on the housetop. Now, I, you, this was probably because I like that. How do we relate to that? Most of us don't go on our housetop. They did in Jesus' day. Matter of fact, I've got, this isn't a really good picture, but I found one that actually had people in it. So you can see that the rooftops, people went there to relax, people went there for whatever reasons, hang out laundry, I don't know. So it's speaking into that kind of a cultural context when Jesus says, on that day, no one is, is uh, on that day, no one who is on the housetop should go down in and get their possessions, just flee, right? And so, and what do we tend to do in an emergency, right? I thought about that. A house fire or something, we want to go get our possessions, right? So what Jesus is saying, don't be attached to this world. Hold loosely to the thing, to this world. Don't be in love with this world. And then he moves back to the Sodom and Gomorrah story, right? Um, verse 31, on that day, let me drop the screen here. On that day, no one who is on the housetop with, um, with possessions inside should go down to get them. Likewise, no one in the field should go back for anything. Remember Lot's wife. Um, so what is there to remember about Lot's wife? I'm not, we're not going to do the whole story. I just, I have a couple of texts here for you. Um, one of them is actually, you know what? Oh, okay. I do have it in there. Good. 
Um, I thought I'd forgotten that second text. In Genesis 19, 17, here's what they were told by the angels. There were two angels. Go read the story. You'll see this. They actually had to lead them out of the city. And then he, uh, the one said to them, as soon as they had brought them out, one of them said, flee for your lives. Don't look back and don't stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to the mountains or you will be swept away. Nine verses later, but Lot's wife looked back. Don't look back. Lot's wife looked back and she became a pillar of salt. So um, the point, <laughs> uh, verse 33, whoever tries to keep their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life will preserve it. Um, trust your life to Jesus. Um, we all trust our life to something. Um, but there's only one way that we can get to eternity safely, and that's with Jesus. Let go of the things of the world. Don't be attached to the stuff in this world. <clears throat> let loose. Let go of it. <clears throat> and um, and don't, don't do what Lot's wife did, who could not resist looking back and in a certain way, definitely disobeying the Lord's servant's command definitely disobeying, and then a sign of her attachment to the world. <clears throat> so then uh, verses 34 and 35, this is a place where I thought we were going to really get like bogged down, like, um, wow, they're going to be, you know, going to unearth some things that aren't obvious, but it's obvious. So let, let me read 34. I tell you on that night, two people will be in one bed, one will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding grain together. One will be taken and the other left. So here we are still at the same point. And here's the point of this text. Be ready. So the Pharisees raise this question about the coming of the kingdom of God. Jesus talks to his disciples, begins to talk about his return. And then everything you're seeing here really is saying, be ready. <laughs> Don't be in love with this world. Don't be attached with this stuff of this world. Be ready for Jesus to return. But then um, this text is, is still referring to the coming of the Lord, but now it's referring to something else, commonly known as the rapture, um, which I'm going to read to you. Let me read about the rapture um, in 1 Thessalonians. Let me find it here for you. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18. It's commonly referred to as the rapture. When the Lord comes back, now listen, uh, listen to the text here. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, the dead in Christ. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, the rapture, that's called the rapture where the living who are still alive are caught up together with the dead who are raising, and it's called the rapture. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. By the way, um, end time stuff was never supposed to be frightening at all. The, the, the second coming of the Lord, the end times, I'll hear uh, believers talk about apocalyptic literature, end time stuff, and sometimes we act like we're overly obs obsessed or scared to death. We weren't supposed to be either. Supposed to be ready and know that you're ready and then encourage each other with these words. Now, finally, that last, I've got to address that verse. And even here, I thought I was going to like find something. And it is, it's kind of cool, but it was nothing. I didn't really have to unearth anything. Just had to think a little bit. Although I don't think it would have ever gotten anywhere unless I had studied. So they ask, so the disciples ask, where, Lord, uh, they asked, and he replied, where there is a dead body, there the vultures will gather. Simply put, this was just an expression. So the disciples could have asked any question here, and Jesus could have responded with this expression. Um, Matter of fact, when I learned a second language, we were in Brazil for a while. When I learned a second language, I learned something that helps me with Bible translation. Expressions aren't always, 
you can't translate them exactly sometimes. Um, like, uh, you know, our expression that you bought a lemon if you bought a bad car. In Brazil, you say you bought a pineapple. Totally true. That's what you say. If you ask them, they can explain it to you. It hurts you. The pineapple's got spiny stuff all over it. It hurts you. So how do you translate that if that was, and it gets hard, right? Um, but in this case, it's just an expression. And then when you realize it's, it's an expression, the, the understanding expression really makes sense. Where there is a dead body, the vultures were gathered. And he's basically responding to him saying, you'll know, it'll be obvious. Where there's dead flesh and meat, vultures go, right? That's easy to understand. And you'll see, and it's obvious to know what's going on there. And you will, it, it'll, be, it'll be obvious. So it's just an expression that, uh, that Jesus was using in that case. So next week, let me uh, give you our text for next week. Next week, Luke chapter 18, verse 15 through 19, 27. And um, I'll tell you, one of the things I was kicking myself for tonight is that we didn't get to the parable of the persistent widow. Another awesome text, very interesting at that, that parable. So go dig on it. And uh, uh, you know how to observe, interpret, and apply now. So go dig in the word of God and learn more about the persistent widow. Let me have a closing word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for our time together this evening. Um, it's, it's interesting to me, Lord, that we close in a time of prayer by contemplating the persistent widow. All of us Probably many of us are aware that we are not supposed to give vain repetition where it's just re repeating words with little understanding and knowledge. But we are encouraged to be persistent in coming before you. And so, Father, we persist in prayer. We persist in our praise and worship. We persist in our going to your word that we know you better. And we persist in our supplications and request. Father, be with each and every person home that's viewing tonight. Bless them with your presence, your help, your comfort, your guide, whatever they have need of. Be their Jehovah Jireh. I pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. As always, have a God week. I'll see you Sunday morning, 9, 30, 11, or next week, Wednesday evening. God bless.